chapter last week on the million dollar question. What was that million dollar question? How long is long and how short is short? All right. Somebody studied before class today. No, I think they might be. And so what we talked about really was two words that were found within that First Corinthians um, uh, discourse, and that was komeo. Does anybody remember what komeo meant? It meant to have, or it is translated as to have long hair. Uh, the definition of it was to wear long hair or to let one's hair grow long. So that was kameo. That was the verb that was used in that First Corinthians set of scriptures. The second one was kome. And kome is a noun used in that same passage of scripture. Uh, we've translated it as hair in verse 15 for her hair is given her for a covering. That kome um, was to mean, as Stephen just mentioned, uncut hair. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so those were two key words that we looked at when we started talking about it. And of course, we went quite a bit uh, uh, into detail beyond that, speaking of not the length of our hair as we look at it for a woman. Okay, because we would look at it and we would gauge it by uh, a speci specified amount of length. Right. We might look at somebody's hair, if it's three inches long, we would say that they're a sinner because they don't have long hair, in our estimation, where that may be where the, the point to which their hair has just grown and they've never cut it. And if they had never cut it, then simply they would be in the Word of God, right? right. But yet we may look at somebody who has hair down to their waist or hair down to their ankles, yet they've been cutting their hair and they would be against the Scripture but in our estimation, we may look at that and say in our eyes, our judgment, that they're okay. They're in the will of God. And so uh, we've, we've got to learn that it's not the length that is necessary. Then we flipped the coin and we looked at the men's hair. And what was the rule that we applied to the how short is short hair uh, for men? I'm the natural. Interesting that none of the men have chimed in. Isn't that a natural line? That That's right. Each, each of us, yeah, come in. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we need to uncome in. Um, with, with men, men you, you have a natural hairline, and that is literally the point where God intends for our hair to be, is this natural line. And that changes over the course of time in our lives. We're not to have these, to grow our hair long and to have these long sweeping comb-overs. We're not to let our hair grow in length and then try to curl it so that it doesn't look as long. Um, literally, the, the scripture is telling us that doesn't nature teach us that long hair on a man is, is wrong? Amen? Amen. All right. And so this week, we're going to start a lesson. I'm not sure if we'll be able to get all the way through it or not, but we're going to give it our best shot. Uh, we're going to pick up a, a new topic here. And really, I want to... Uh, preface this topic by giving you a little bit of understanding that in the, the scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, there is reference periodically to a, uh, the nation of Israel or the church today being in bondage. Everybody, any, anybody ever read that kind of a, a literary um, a scripture reference in the Word of God? Okay. When it talks about being in bondage, Typically, the reference is to Egypt, in bondage to Egypt. Uh, and the reason for that is because Egypt was typed and shadowed as the world, okay? And so they would be in bondage to the world. In other words, they left the principles and guidelines of God, and they went looking into the world for what the world had to offer. They would begin to replace the godly uh, uh, guidelines. They would begin to replace the godly virtues, the godly morals, the godly uh, commands, and they would replace them with something that fit the bill that the world was selling at the time. Okay? And so today our topic is who really is in bondage? Who really is in bondage? And so we start with this premise or this question, if you will. Is it possible to have the wrong covering? Is it possible to have the wrong covering? We're going to start with a, a uh, set of scriptures in Isaiah chapter 30. If you 
you have your Bibles and you would like to follow along, Isaiah chapter 30, verses 1 and 2, the scripture says this, it says, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, they, that walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Again, the reference that you see there. Who really is in bondage? So if we kind of pull this scripture reference apart and we start to look at it in some chunks, we can begin to uh, discern what exactly it is we're looking at. Woe to the rebellious children that take counsel but not counsel of God. In other words, they've left the guidelines, the precepts, the commands of God. In fact, they're no more inquiring of God in right. how to live their lives or how God should guide their lives, okay? And it says, they cover with a covering, but not of my spirit. See, each of us pray, similar to David, uh, let me abide under the shadow of the Almighty, a spiritual covering in our lives. And so we want the, the, the guidelines of God, the precepts of God. Because when we are obedient to the scripture of God, then as we talked about in one of the previous lessons, we're sort of under that umbrella of protection of God. Okay? And, and so what it's talking about is we're not under that shadow, we're not under that umbrella, but the rebellious children have left that, but they're still covering. They're covering with a different covering. Now, this is why they're covering with a covering. That they may add sin to sin. To strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Okay? Uh, you don't have to raise your hand on this one if you don't want to. But how many of you have ever done something wrong and then in the midst of it and you were questioned about it, the only thing that you could think of to do was to lie? Mm -hmm. I've got a couple honest people and a couple people going, I don't know if I want to answer this question. Mm -hmm. I didn't say it had to be like yesterday or today, okay? You don't have to. All right. Yeah. That's a covering. What you're trying to do is you're trying to cover something up. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is you're adding sin to sin. Right. You see the simple concept of how that works? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what the scripture here is talking about as Isaiah was, was uh, getting word from the Lord is that the, the rebellious children, they leave these concepts and precepts of God and they begin to walk after the things of this world not even realizing the bondage that they are placing themselves in, and they replace the covering of a godly spiritual covering with a covering that allows them to cover sin with more sin. You can see the problem that when you go down that route, you just continue to put blankets upon blankets upon blankets on top of your sin because you're always weaving the web bigger to cover what needs to be covered. Until you come to God and you bear it all and say, God, please take my sin away. Yes. So, again, Egypt throughout the scripture has been typified as sin in the place of bondage. And so their reference here, obviously, is that they've left the things of God and they've gone after a place of bondage. Uh, a missionary was given some, uh, it was a conversation between a missionary woman and, and, and uh, the author of the book. She said returning home after many years on the mission field, she began to look at women's magazines, as is the case with most women. They, whether you're at the uh, dentist's office or the uh, grocery store or wherever it is, you just seem to be drawn to those magazines that they place on the tables or in the racks. And you begin to pick them up. And she said, after having been on the missions field and away from it for so long, she said, this is what she said, she felt ugly when she read them. Now, nothing had changed in her life, but she said she felt ugly when she read them because of the embellishments that they prescribed that were necessary, a must, needed for beauty. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, 
<coughs> what do those magazines talk about? Okay? Well, on the front cover of almost every single one of them is how to lose 25 pounds in two weeks. Right. Yeah. Right? Yes. How to please your man. Yes. <coughs> and various assorted discussions like that. And they're filled with advertisements for things that will cause that to take place. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. Whether it be makeup or garments or different uh, enhancements and embellishments to your body, not your spirit, but to your body, mm -hmm. that will make you beautiful. All right? All right? Amen. And so she refused to be influenced by them and their counsel, and so she chose to per no longer to purchase them. As I have counseled many a time on many different levels, is that we have to be careful of what we bring into our homes. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful of what we allow our eyes to see. Yes, I know you're piqued by that, you know, recipe for some souffle that, that talks about, or you're piqued and, and curious about the prince's child or whatever it is, you know, that's on the front cover. Or, you just, you really like this particular actor or actress and you followed them for years and, well, they're getting divorced and so you just got to know the dirty details. <laughs> and so you open up these magazines and you have to be careful because as you open up that magazine, you're not only looking at that souffle. Right. Right. But your eyes and your, your spirit will take in the entirety of what is in that magazine. And what is it telling you about you? All right? Who really is in bondage? Mm -hmm. The beauty of this world is a painted caricature compared to the true beauty of holiness. That's right. Okay? The most beautiful women in the entire world are the handmaidens of the Lord. In fact, the Bible even describes for us, I believe it's in Psalm, uh, to them that are the beauty of holiness. Mm -hmm. right. Okay? Somebody that is living right before God, somebody that is holy in their spiritual nature and their desire and their actions mimic their desire to follow after God in every aspect, they have a true beauty. Not like the beauty that the world is selling and pushing forward. We shouldn't take our counsel from Egypt, but rather from the New Jerusalem, if you will. Um, Psalm opens with this scripture. It says, Blessed is the one that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor right. sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And so are we truly blessed because we're following after or not following after the advice and the counsel of Egypt? That's where it really comes down to the rub. If, if you have something that's influencing you mm -hmm. to follow after the, the fads, the fashions, the, the, uh, to trying to get you to pattern yourself after the things of Egypt, then we really must take a, a, a retrospective look because the Bible tells us, and be not conformed to the world. Right? Mm -hmm. To be conformed means to be molded and to shape and to literally become right. a, a duplicate of. Right. But it says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. All right? The, the battleground is not your face and what you put on it. Right. The battleground is not your nails, mm -hmm. not your weight. Okay? It's not something that you're putting on yourself. The battleground is where the spirit lies mm -hmm. and what works through your mind. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, I have noticed this concept, and, and several of you may have noticed this, but when I go to a general conference, or I know some of the youth talked about it when they came back from uh, North American Youth Congress just uh, this last year, that when a, a city is overrun by apostolics, and I mean true godly apostolics, it's something that that city takes, sits up and they take notice of. You just can't miss it. All these people walking around with, you know, the, the godly hairdos and the godly dresses, and, and, and it's just simply amazing. Mm -hmm. And the, the book uh, mentions that a minister friend was telling of being in an elevator during one of the general conference, and he heard over her two businessmen talking about all of the lovely women with their beautiful hair and attractive clothing. 
The two men were amazed to see women who looked and acted like ladies. See, the world will recognize the beauty and elegance of God's people, even though the world is projecting right. that the only way to truly be beautiful right, is, to. is to take what God has given and cover it. And so let's, let's look at that. Of course, we know that 1 Peter chapter 2 tells us that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. The purpose of us, the last part of that verse says, is to show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Now, literally, and I know we've talked about this in, in a couple of sermons in years past, but that Greek word for praise in that verse of scripture is the word erite. Everybody say erite. Erite. Aren't you glad for all the Greek that you get when you come to Tuesday night? See, you can say you speak Greek. Tome, tomeo, erite. You have a limited umpo vocabulary. That's French, not Greek. All right. We're mixing it all up now. But literally, it's not talking about showing forth praises like we're going to get up and wave our hands in the air. We're going to get up and, and shout and sing into a microphone. It's not the type of praise it's talking about. Literally, if you want to look at it, it's talking about our virtues. Mm -hmm. That we should show ver forth the virtue of him who hath called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Virtue means conformity to a standard of right. Morality, a particular moral excellence, an active power to accomplish a given effect, potency, efficacy, chaste. When the woman with the issue of blood was crawling through all of the people and they were all thronging Jesus, she reached out and she grabbed the hold of the hem of his garment. Isn't that right? Anybody remember this story? Right. Having had the issue of blood for such a long time, having dealt all of her money to all the different types of people who offered some kind of cure, she came and she rested at one last chance to be healed. And that was this person that everybody talked about, Jesus. And when she crawled and she crawled and she crawled and she could but reach out and grab a hold of the hem of his garment, the Bible declares to us that instantly the issue of blood was gone. Jesus instantly stopped and said what? Who, had Who touched, my touched me? Who touched me? The natural response of the, the disciples in this instance was, oh my Lord. <laughs> What do you mean who touched you? I mean, we got people crawling on other people. We got people jumping over people. Everybody's reaching out. Everybody's just trying to get a hold of you. What do you mean who touched me? And he said, these people didn't touch me. Right. Now, see, some of us, that, that blows our mind. Right. Because what do you mean they didn't touch you? And, and his definition of touch is different than our definition right. of touch. Because his definition said, somebody touched me because I felt virtue, virtue lead my body. body. Mm -hmm. A moral excellence. A chasteness. All right, you understand what we're talking about here? Mm -hmm. And so then we're supposed to show that same moral excellence, that same chastity that was talked about in that particular instance because we are that chosen generation. We are that royal priesthood. We are that holy nation. We are that peculiar people. All right? Amen. And so when we look at this, Arate, remember that. And we should show forth the virtue of him who hath called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. All right? So how can we shine this beacon of light, this, this image of virtue into a darkened world if we look like they look? If we dress like they dress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we pattern ourselves after what the world declares is beauty. Mm -hmm. Instead of after what the scripture declares is beauty. And see, this is where we have to be careful as the children of God. We have got to follow after the things of God. Even in the, the uh, aspect that the world is telling us, oh no, you are so plain. Mm -hmm. 
You don't look good because of this. You are missing out. You could be so much more beautiful. Right. Hmm. If you would just lighten up this or put a little of this on, it just starts off small. Do you realize that's how drug dealers start? Right. You could reach even better highs. Here, have a free sample right. of this. Yep. Why? Because once they get you hooked with even just a little bit, they know you'll come banging on their door mm -hmm. to start buying that which you never needed to begin with. Right. All right? right. And so we've got to be careful. We are to shine forth that same virtue, that same moral excellence that God does when we conform to his standard of righteousness. When we choose to conform ourselves to the world's standard of righteousness, we are actually not shining any light at all. Oh, we may saunter around and we may have social networks that are filled with other people. But we're not shining forth anything that God is wanting to shine forth. And so, we have to understand the, the capacity of which God is talking to us. If we follow the teachings of Paul, we understand that 1 Corinthians 11, 2 says, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 says this, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. God is still looking for that chaste virgin who has kept herself without spot, without blemish, Without any such thing, right? Amen. That's what he's looking for. He doesn't want all that other stuff on. Because all it does is cover what God has given us to shine forth. Now, this is going to sound perhaps somewhat abrasive. This is going to sound somewhat... Uh, perhaps judgmental. I want you to take it in the aspect of which I am trying to deliver it to you. Obviously, I'm trying to help you understand in a graduated way that this is the aspect of the way that we should look at what the world is offering us. All right? But Christ is not coming back for a harlot, all painted up, looking for the next man on the, on the way. Right. Okay? Right. He's looking for that chaste virgin who wants to be a faithful bride to him. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, the modern woman today, I am not a woman, so I am going to take this second hand and deliver to you. <laughs> All right, some of you who may have come out of the world may be able to say amen. Some of you who have family still in the world may be able to further say amen. Some of you that have friends and family that are in the world, you certainly could probably say amen. But the modern woman today still uses a covering. It's just not the spiritual covering of abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. They're shedding their hair. And they're covering up the beauty that God has intended for them to shine forth with makeup. Right. They substitute for their long hair that God has ordained. And they put in its place this kit, a makeup kit, which is filled with a variety of different items to enhance the beauty of anybody. If you think of the instance of Jezebel in the Old Testament, she had heard that so-and-so was coming, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. She'd gotten wind of it. Yep. Yep. And she said that she knew that he was coming to kill her, but she had one last chance left. Mm -hmm. If she could entice him, mm -hmm. right. then perhaps she could persuade him not to kill her, right. and she would become his. So what did she do? She got out her fanciest dress, put her hair up in a nice kind of bun, and washed her face and ran to the window. That's not what she did. 
She got the most seductive dress that she could find. She put her hair down and she painted her face. Why? Because then she went to the window and she looked out in the most alluring way possible. Now let your imagination do the rest of the work there. And she's like, oh, you who, Jehu. <laughs> As if nothing was going on trying to entice. Instead of glorying in the appearance and the recognition of long hair and a clean face, the world says that we must glorify or beautify our appearance with a covering of makeup and other adornments. The substitute for which God has is cheap and tawdry. We should get our counsel from godly guidelines found within the word of God rather than cheap substitutes right. found in the tabloids of a world of bondage. All right? Amen. Now, here's where it gets kind of rough. Okay? We have heard the advice they offer, well, if the barn needs painting, then paint it. Uh -huh. Meaning, uh -huh. if you're not extremely beautiful, right. just the way you are, then let's fix it. How do you fix it? You paint it. I, I don't know. I've, I've had four daughters. Still have four daughters. Have one wife. Still have one wife. And I don't consider any of them to be barns. All right? Thanks, Dad. Thank you. Thank you. I don't consider any of them to be bonds. Yeah. You know, I, I don't understand where the concept or, or, or exactly how the, the, the thought process makes sense to somebody to paint it. All right? It's not a car. It's not a barn. It's not the side of a building. It's not a sign. It's not something that should be painted. Psalm 144 tells us this, or it likens our sons to living plants and our daughters to polished cornerstones of a palace. Now, I'm slightly confused. How many of you run out and you paint your rose bushes? You paint your fern? No, we don't, we don't paint living plants, right? No. Okay. How many of you um, go see? You go to the zoo, and and you see them painting the dots on and the stripes. On the and the lions. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you go out and you look at the uh, the elephant, and they wanted to paint it pink. Anybody? No. So you just thought that those were zebras. Really, they were horses. <laughs> so they painted black and white stripes on them, right? Look, we, we don't do these things. These things don't make sense. I mean, it's, you guys are all laughing. It's comical to even think about something so crazy. I didn't want a, a, a dog of many colors, so I just got the spray can, and I just painted it all green. No, it's retarded, isn't it? <laughs> We would never accomplish such tasks. In fact, in the day and age that we live in today, if any of us were foolish enough to even begin to think that we could do that, a neighbor would call the police on us and we'd be thrown into prison for such uh, d demonstrative tasks of cruelty to animals. Right? All right. So, then why do we think that we should take the the beauty that God has given. And we should cover it with some paint. Now, the longer the paint is worn, the more it ages the skin. And you, you can look at people in our society today that have worn makeup for years and years and years next to somebody who has not but is the same age and what you begin to find you begin to find that there is a drastic difference in the look and feel of their skin 
because they have tried to cover that beauty that God gave with some facsimile, uh, uh, some, some poor substitute of what beauty the world thinks should be. Of course, when I was growing up, there was a new thing on the market. It was a brand new thing. They called it oil of ole. Anybody ever heard of that? Yes, my mom loves it. And their tagline is still to this day, it can make you look younger too. Yes. Why? Well, because you know what? We've damaged enough by painting ourselves through all the years that before we get up and paint ourselves today, when we go to bed at night and take all the paint off, we should rub on something to make us look younger again. Wow. Just can't be satisfied with what God has made us to be. All right. Um, <clears throat> we'll get into the feminist concept quite a bit in some of the later dialogues that we have uh, in, in some of the other books. But consider this for just a moment. Isn't it crazy that the feminist culture of the world that we live in today is not absolutely blowing a gasket with the fact that women are to paint themselves, but men aren't? I mean, what happened to equal rights, right? Huh? It is amazing to me. Men don't paint, put on the eyeliner, blush. They still don't think they do. There's no amens in the house. I'm very worried now. <laughs> Why is it that the men aren't falling into this, this trap of, you know, if you want to be beautiful, you want to be attractive to other people, that you have to put all this other stuff on? Mm -hmm. I guess men aren't concerned about it, maybe. Mm. Even the single ones. All right. <laughs> there are several instances of different things that um, really you know, should be eye-openers to us. I know I've heard the phrase personally as I was growing up uh, from many different places. It's, it's in the book here uh, with several instances and references. Maybe it's something that you have said personally at some point during your life. Uh, I know that I, um, I was ready to go somewhere at one time in my life and without, you know, casting dispersions in any particular direction, uh, the, the female that I was with at that time said, I can't possibly go yet. It's going to take me at least 15 to 20 minutes to get ready because I can't go anywhere without putting on my face. Mm -hmm. Now, just the, the, doesn't that just sound strange? Like, we're all faceless people. That until, wasn't me to we, anybody. <laughs> we just pick up a face and put on our face, right? Really, who is in bondage? I know some people won't even go outside to the mailbox. Some people won't get in their car and go anywhere, even through a drive through unless they put on their face. I'm baffled as to what the concept is and, and why we have fallen into this trap so, so full-heartedly that we think that the world is concerned with this face. Galatians chapter 4 verse 26 says, But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. We've all been born in the church that is free and has made us free. We're free from the laws of sin and death. Mm -hmm. If we're living within the borders of the world and its bondage, or I should say Egypt, then who is really in bondage? Mm -hmm. Because doesn't the scripture tell us, he that the Son is set free is free, free, free indeed. Well, thank you, everybody. Is free indeed. Mm -hmm. That's the liberty. That's the power. That's what the Spirit of God and the covering of God provides for each and every one of us. If we're willing to walk in. But we can't hold on to the concepts and things of bondage and still apply Egypt into our life and think we're going to be satisfying to God. Because that's like saying, I'll take your freedom and I'll see you a, a can of hairspray, a little bit of eyeliner and some blush. 
Because I'm going to take what you've given and I'm going to make definite improvements. Right. That's why, you know, and, and I've heard many preachers, they don't want to touch this subject with a 10-foot pole. But if you're dyeing your hair, I'm telling you, you're wrong. Amen. You're wrong. If God made you blonde, guess what? Stick with it. If God gave you gray hair at 16, there's a reason. All right? In Sean's case, if you don't got no hair, God made you that way. No way. Just walk with it. All right? You don't need a toupee. We don't need to dye our hair. We don't need to buy uh, uh, eye lenses, contact lenses that change our eye color. Why? We're so dissatisfied with what God has made. Where did this concept come from? i tell you where it came from. It came from when man started infiltrating <laughs> the things of God and putting in replacements. For spiritual things, man put in replacements. Makeup being one of these. We'll talk about makeup more um, in a further lesson from a historical perspective. But listen to, listen to this um, concept here. Um, Sister Reader writes in this particular instance that she was at the mall shopping with her family when she came upon a fashion display being put on by the encyclopedia uh, people. It spotlighted the last 100 years of fashions. And of course, by being a display, it had mannequins with people, uh, mannequins dressed with all the fashions from each of those eras, I guess you, you would call them today. And, and it detailed from the encyclopedia perspective of why the change in each of the fashions and where the, 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 the driving force for each of those fashions came from. And it was amazing. As she details here, she says, we were quite interested to read that the fashions of the Roaring Twenties in which women began to rebel, to cut off their hair, raise their hemlines, and wear makeup were actually a result of the discovery of King Tut's tomb. Now, talk about going back to Egypt, right? <laughs> It all went back to King Tut's tomb. How is it? Well, this is what happened. Uh, as they excavated King Tut's tomb, everything from that era came out. And because it was blasted in such a positive, amazing finds, oh, can you believe? And it was just put out there in society in such a dramatic way, people began to emulate things that they saw. Yeah. Here it is. The women began to paint their faces and cut their hair to model themselves after the fashions of Egypt. It was all the rage. You weren't somebody unless you were emulating that which was found. It was the fashion that drove everything in that era. Now, they even went to the point where they wore serpent headbands and bracelets. Yeah. Like the pictures and things that they found in Egypt. The problem is, guess who wore those things in Egypt? Egyptians. Egyptians. Ding, 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 ding. But there was a certain sect of the Egyptians. It wasn't the kings and queens. It wasn't the people of authority and power. It was the slaves. What they had uncovered was all of this material on the slaves. And what we were doing as Americans were buying it hook, line, and sinker, and running out after these latest fads and fashions found in King Tut's tomb, and we didn't think that we were making ourselves slaves to the world that we lived in. Once again, mankind has been duped into something as they bite into the forbidden fruit, and the chains of slavery become tightened ever so much more. Paul exhorts us in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 1, to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us. What's that last word? Um, okay. In which Christ hath made us free. Free. Yeah. Free. The concept here that we're talking about throughout this lesson was who is really in bondage. Okay. Let us stand fast, therefore, in the liberty in which Christ hath made us free. 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 Mm -hmm. And he goes on to say, and be not entangled again in what? The yoke, the yoke of, of bondage. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there's always going to be this alluring draw from the world. 
playing upon the senses of mankind, trying to draw us in, be it female or male, trying to draw us back to the things of old, trying to put something new out there so that it sparkles, it dazzles, it glamorous. If, if you've just got to have one, if you're going to be anybody. I mean, really, some of the first cell phones weren't bought because people needed them. They were sex symbols. Today, they're so much of a commonality that it's not a status symbol anymore. Right. Having the newest one is a status symbol. There you go. Running out and your contract's just two months in and getting the next new one. <laughs> in fact, some cell phone companies have actually changed their contract guidelines to allow you to do that. Why? Because they know that it's the driving force within mankind. Right. There are so many things out there that are trying to lure you and just draw you slowly. And why? Because the world wants the church to be in bondage. Mm -hmm. And God has said, be content with my covering. Now, David had fallen into sin. David had fallen into traps. David had fallen into enough things in his life. That when he said that he wanted to dwell under the shadow of the Almighty, he was making a statement and said, I don't ever want to go back to the things and the problems and the person that I used to be. Let me feel free to dance before the Lord with all my might and not wonder who's looking and why. Right. Let me feel free to be into the liberty in which God has made me. To pray and to worship and to sing psalms. Why? Because that's that's what God had made mm -hmm. him to be. Yes. Nobody trained him to write spiritual songs, to play on his harp. It's who God made him to be. Right. And God made each and every one of us that's in this place. God made each and every one of you special in your right. Why should we take and say, I want to be like so-and-so mm -hmm. and try to change ourselves? Right. Even, if, even to the point where preachers within the church, mm -hmm. I'm not content with the way I preach. I want to be him, like, just like him. I would name some names, but since these kids are recording this, I don't want to start throwing names <laughs> out there. But every preacher has a preacher that he idolizes the capabilities to, for that preacher to either teach or to, to, to you know, really reach into the depths or to bring up stories of the, the depth of knowledge that that preacher has. And we have to be careful. God didn't call you to be a preacher to emulate somebody else. He called you because of the giftings that he's gifted you with. Right? Right? It extends into every aspect and area of life that we live in. Men and women, he created us to be who we are. Minus the sin and full of holiness. Amen. See, you were born into sin. You were shaped by iniquity. Yeah. But God hath called all men yeah. unto repentance. Unto repentance, that's right. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. True liberty and freedom are only found in the church. So to answer the question that we started with in the chapter's title, who really is in bondage, the answer is loud and clear. It's not the church, but instead it's those that have been taken captive by Egypt. Right. And see, that's how they will attack you. They'll say that the church is not relevant. The church is old-fashioned. You're old fuddy-duddies. You're dressing like my great-grandma used to dress. You're wearing your hair like, oh, you look at these encyclopedia pictures from 4,000 years ago. Makes sense. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Dangerous is the concept that if I stay a fatter fashion behind the world, the world yeah. that I'm not part of the world. Right. Danger is that concept. Right. Very dangerous is it to enter into that thought process. Mm -hmm. All right? Yeah. Let's stand.